Hi, I'm Brad Hansen, a Cooperative Extension Weed Specialist at UC Davis. My presentation this morning is going to be about uh, some things to think about in terms of managing weeds in young orchards, which have uh, uh, some special challenges relative to more established cropping systems. So just a, a quick rundown, young orchards, like any other orchard system, have a, a variety of weed management issues to deal with. You know, we think about weed control efficacy, particularly with herbicides, but we're also trying to balance that with uh, crop safety and injury concerns with our mechanical or chemical weed control. We've got issues around new weeds and new orchards going into new cropping systems. One of my areas of research is herbicide resistance, so that's a factor we try to include in our decision-making processes. And then in the bigger picture from a state uh, registration and pesticide, uh, uh, herbicide labeling process, you know, we do research and provide support for that as well, as well as trade issues including MRL, uh, uh, maximum residue levels in our export crops. The first step in any orchard management program really is effective, um, <clears throat> effectively identifying the weeds. There's no weed management practice that's equally effective on all herbicides, so we want to make sure we're really, um, we really understand what weed spectrum we're trying to control. That really can influence our herbicide selection so that we can select herbicides that work on the weed spectrum that we're trying to control. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I always tell this story. A lot of the times I'll get a call about um, a question from a grower or from a pest control advisor. You know, this herbicide didn't work on this weed. What's going on? And I have to tell them the answer is that herbicide doesn't work on that weed. You, you basically pick the wrong tool for the problem at hand. Uh, the next step is really key is properly applying the material. We've identified the weed, we've selected a herbicide that works on that, and we want to make sure we're applying it as well as, as possible. That really includes equipment calibration, um, appropriate timing, you know, weed size um, and rate uh, uh, for, you know, to uh, get good control, and the appropriate growth stage for the weed. Again, a, a lot of times our failure is uh, we've picked it, we know our weed, we've picked a good herbicide, but we've applied it too late or too large of a weed and we get poor weed control. One really effective tool that I use for helping identify uh, weeds in, a, in an orchard system is available on the Weed Research and Information Center website. This is a, um, you can see that, that uh, outline on the slide, but it's got a, a really photo-based weed identification tool. It's really useful if you're not a weed taxonomist, if you, if you just have some basic characteristics and can then narrow down a large list to a smaller list of photos to identify. So in orchard crops, we've got a number of weed challenges. We have our old favorites, as I, as I talk about. Uh, our normal mix of annual uh, grasses and broadleaves it can vary among different areas of the state. We also have challenges with perennial weeds, and this is really a challenge as some, as some of our former annual crop ground is going into new orchards. So we've got uh, fields coming out of cotton or tomatoes and, and going into almonds or pistachios or walnuts can really have some challenges with uh, perennial weeds, particularly field bindweed but also uh, the nut sedges. In terms of our new weed problems, a lot of our, our issues seem to be related to either glyphosate resistance, the, the Roundup resistant and glyphosate resistant uh, weeds, and also shifting populations to weeds that are just not well controlled with Roundup. We'd call that tolerance. Um, and then to a lesser extent, we have uh, shifting control options. In our orchard systems, we're seeing much less uh, tillage-based weed control because of the speed and dust concerns and also the uh, heavy equipment cost. Uh, we have a few new herbicides, and I'll talk about those in a couple of minutes, but we, we're also having some herbicides and some options being removed because of either air quality or uh, water quality issues related to pesticide use in orchard systems. As I mentioned at the outset, young orchards have even more challenges than our established orchards. These crops are young trees and young vines as well, are much less competitive with weeds than an established orchard crop. So we've, we've got a little bit of a, a harder challenge there. Um, they're also a little bit more sensitive to herbicide injury. Um, they've, got shallower, they've got smaller root systems, they've got shallower roots, they've got a number of issues that can make them uh, slightly more sensitive to injury. Um, and, and as well to other uh, weed control tactics including tillage. And then Probably most importantly, we tend to have much fewer, many fewer herbicide options available in new plantings. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the labels, uh, herbicide labels, but many of them, because of crop safety concerns, will have some sort of caveat not to be used on orchards less than 12 months or 18 months or um, you know, several years in some cases. So that's something to be aware of as a particular challenge in young orchards. So as I said, you can see a few photos here. New plantings are just not very uh, competitive with weeds. There's a, a 
the upper left photo is a brand new planting an almond orchard down in the Merced area. And you can see, you know, this is 99% bare ground and, and the trees are taking up, providing very low canopy um, for, uh, to compete with weeds. That photo in the lower right is actually a former cotton field that has gone into almonds, it looks like. I mean, you can see the weed spectrum there that's been selected by the annual cropping system. That's going to be a real challenge for the first few years of that, that uh, young orchard. And you can imagine the amount of competition that uh, spectrum of uh, sedges and morning glories are having with that young uh, orchard in terms of water use, fertilizer, sunlight, all the, the normal com competitive impacts. Young orchards also have, as I mentioned, very small canopies. You can see that grape vineyard in the upper, upper left and that young pomegranate planting in the lower right. There's a lot of sunlight hitting the ground, which is really, you know, um, helpful for weeds that, that value sun. In, in both of those photos, that's primarily yellow nut sedge. The nut sedges tend to be real problems in our young orchards and young vineyards, but much less of a problem as the trees gain uh, size and put out enough shade and canopy to shade out those uh, sun-loving weeds like nut sedges. But they're real challenges in the early years of an orchard. Uh, as part of an IPM program, weed management in young orchards can also um, inter interact with other pests. And in this case, you can see girdling on that young olive tree, I think, from, from uh, moles and moles that are harbored by heavy weed populations at the base of the tree. So this all sort of ties together in terms of good weed management can reduce our problems with vertebrate pests. It can also change some of our sensitivity to insect and disease uh, pathogens as well. Probably the most critical decision in terms of a young orchard is thinking about weed management before you put that young orchard in. I've got a photo here of a, a tomato system on the UC Davis campus, but we've seen a lot of orchards going into exactly this kind of, well, maybe not quite this heavy of vine weed population, but certainly very heavy weed populations that have been selected by previous crops, uh, particularly the annual cropping system. The time to control, if I was going to plant an orchard into this field, I think you'd really want to think about doing some heavy control strategies on this bindweed population before you come in there with your brand new almond planting or brand new pistachio planting because you've just got a lot more choices in bare ground um, from a herbicide standpoint. Um, in young orchards, we have a lot of uh, questions and, and uh, benefits of cover crops and intercrops, but there's uh, issues to be that all play in the weed management programs. This can be really tempting to put in an intercrop primarily, primarily for some uh, income on that acre in, uh, in early years when you've got, a, again, a lot of sunlight hitting the ground. And you can also have some benefit from a weed competition standpoint, uh, orchard access because you've got um, uh, vegetative cover, um, water infiltration, soil building in some cases. Um, but one, it, you need to remember that the crops growing in those middles can be just as competitive as weeds for water and nutrients, and they have to be able to manage that. Um, so just, you know, to be, to be uh, be cognizant of that. We've done some work in recent years thinking about summer versus winter uh, cover crops. So there's real differences in terms of uh, competitive ability if you've got a winter wheat cover crop, say, in that young orchard compared to a, a corn crop in the summertime. And so there's, um, I, I think there's much less danger of impacting the long-term health of that orchard with a winter crop because, again, the tree's not very, growing very much. You've hopefully got rainfall so you're not competing with your, your irrigation water and um, you're not competing with the trees for the water you're applying and the fertilizers you're applying. On the other hand, the summer crops can be direct competitors, probably even more so than a weedy population out there. Really important point here is that some of those early weed competition or herbicide safety consequences in a young orchard can have really long-term impacts on that orchard. This photo actually shows a fumigation issue. The trees in the, the peach trees in the foreground were in unfumigated uh, soil. The trees in the background were fumigated. You can see how stunted they are after several years. The same thing can happen, though. Um, this, that particular photo is a pathogen issue. But if we had a weed competition early on, we could see stunting very similarly. That's going to carry through perhaps for several, you know, 10 or 15 years in, a, in an orchard crop because they didn't get a good start they're not going to uh, catch up very easily. <clears throat> As I mentioned, trees, young trees are also much more sensitive than larger trees or established orchards to some of our herbicide control uh, practices. One of the points I make in all of my extension talks is that most of our herbicides can injure trees. We get crop safety because of placement. 
we apply our foliar herbicides below the canopy of the of the orchard crop, and we hopefully keep them above the root zone of the orchard crop. It's where we get into either uh, drift into the canopy or leaching into the root zone where we can, can get some injury. A couple of photos here on the left is uh, glufosinate or uh, rely herbicide injury on young almond tree trunks from several years ago. And uh, on the right is a farm advisor looking at a glyphosate drift case into a young peach orchard. And those are, those are issues with labeled herbicides um, probably not applied as well as they should have been. Proximity to herbicides is, is what drives that crop safety. Um, are, you can see uh, there's a much smaller crop canopy. So if you get drift into that crop canopy, for example, on that photo, uh, young pistachio on the, the right and older pistachios on the left, if you have a little bit of drift into that, that small canopy, you're affecting a greater proportion of the leaves and the photosynthetic apparatus of that tree. We tend to have much lower branches in the young, uh, younger orchards before this uh, trees have been skirted up or before we've got those trees really the main scaffolds uh, selected on almonds, for example. We also have lots of new growth. A greater proportion of that tree is young leaves and young tissue compared to the, the older trees. And they have smaller root system and probably more shallow roots, especially in that first year or so after planting. Um, and then finally, right after planting, we don't always have uh, the soil settled around those trees and that that loosely packed soil or cracks around that, that newly planted tree can be routes of um, mass flow uh, of herbicide down into the deeper portions of the, the soil profile where our trees can be exposed. So those are all things to think about in terms of when to apply herbicides and what herbicides might be safe, particularly in that first few months or, or six months after planting. Young trees also, um, as, I, as I mentioned, we can see a lot of um, different kinds of symptoms. Both of these photos show <clears throat> excuse me, glyphosate injury on young prunes on the upper left and young almonds on the, on the lower right. On the, that prune tree on the left is actually a sucker. So we tend to have, uh, well, some of our rootstocks sucker more than others. But young trees tend to sucker more than, than older trees as well. So that certainly doesn't uh, affect the orchard very much by injuring that sucker, but a certain amount of that herbicide is going to go back into the, into the main tree and, and uh, could impact yield, especially if we're in the early, early years of that orchard. That almond tree on the lower right was actually um, prior year exposure to glyphosate herbicide. So we're seeing um, um, issues then in the, the subsequent year's um, leaves as they push out, and we're, we're seeing some injury um, in a few cases. That's not very common, but it can happen and, and something to be aware of. I've been talking mostly about young orchard crops, but I think a, another challenge is putting young trees in existing orchards as a replant problem. So we, we certainly, we, we may not want to use the same herbicides in a, a scattered replants in, a, in an existing orchard, but we need to be cautious about uh, avoiding the situation here. You can see that big uh, patch of hairy fleabane with uh, young almond trees, and the, the orchard manager didn't want to use whatever herbicide they'd been using in the strips on those young trees, so they shut the sprayer off, which is a good move, but they didn't come back and, and use something else to control the weeds around that young tree. I'd be uh, honestly, I'd be surprised if that tree uh, amounted to anything because of the amount of competition in that particular orchard. So that we've got to balance the needs of the, the uh, established trees along with the, the inner plants or replants. And they may take different control strategies for those weeds. I mentioned earlier my, my lab's work on resistance. And this is certainly an issue that we need to think about on a more holistically on an orchard management, uh, weed management program. This is a young walnut orchard. I, I use this photo all the time showing early stages of a glyphosate resistant weed infestation. And you can see um, in the springtime in that, that young walnut orchard, they used a, a glyphosate and probably glyphosate and gold to burn everything down. And just a few ryegrass plants survived in that orchard. It was a very small problem. Well, several years later, that orchard is completely uh, covered with rye, uh, glyphosate resistant ryegrass. So um, scouting fields and identifying problems at the early stage and, and controlling them can really help uh, minimize the long-term uh, consequences of, of resistance as it starts to occur. So I want to talk just a few minutes um, in a general sense about herbicides available in orchard cropping systems. This is um, something, uh, a chart that I put together every year or I update every year on herbicides that are registered in all of the tree and vine crops in California. And we talked a little bit about the mode of action, the herbicide modes of action, that's that colored column. Now it's going to be challenging to see on the on the screen, but this can be downloaded 
from the Weed Research and Information Center. It can also be found on the Weed Science blog and, and a number of uh, newsletters and other online sources. So I won't belabor it here. But what I do want to talk about specifically is herbicides that are registered on tree nuts that are less than two years old. With the changing cropping systems in California, we're seeing lots of young orchard crops, lots of young tree nuts, walnuts, uh, almonds, pistachios. And so we, we don't have as many choices for herbicides in those young orchards as we do in established orchards, but we do have quite a few. And I'll just make a couple of comments here. You can see my, my two columns there are pre-emergent herbicides and post-emergent herbicides. Um, I would say the most important that we've seen in some of the, the tree cropping systems in the recent years have been um, Allion herbicide can be used on orchards more, uh, at least one year after planting. Trellis used to be branded as gallery. This is registered on, on uh, new plantings. It's been a really good herbicide for that use. Goal and Prowl or Goal and Surfland are very commonly used in these uh, orchards and can provide pretty good uh, broad spectrum pre-emergent weed control in orchards. Uh, Matrix is, is commonly used as well. Pindar GT, depending on the crop, can be used at nine months or 15 months. Read the label to get the specifics there. <clears throat> Excuse me. In terms of post-emergent weed control, we have we have several herbicides, but I, I would I would classify these as um, need to make sure you are trying to control the right weeds and using the right herbicide. Our most uh, several of these are, are contact materials like uh, Shark, uh, Rely, Gramoxone, Venue, Trevix on that list. Uh, they, and they actually can burn green bark, so, so I would be very cautious about using these on very young plantings if you've taken the cartons off. So this is where in leaving those uh, milk cartons on the, on the trees for at least one, maybe two seasons would be beneficial from a crop safety standpoint. Um, glyphosate is probably the most commonly used. In the, tree, in the almonds and pistachios, this is used pretty often in young trees. Uh, walnuts tend, walnut growers tend not to use glyphosate as much in the first year or two, especially if the cartons have come off because of suckering and, and concerns about green bark uptake. Just be cautious about, about the herbicides. Again, we don't have much um, uh, complete tolerance to herbicides. This is mostly placement. So if you've got green bark out there, most of these herbicides can be taken up to, a, to one degree or another by green bark. I'd like to run through just a few herbicides that uh, provide a few updates on some herbicides used in these systems. Um, glufosinate herbicides, this is a, um, formerly we, we had a product called Rely, and then Rely 200, then Rely 280. It was really important, uh, but came in short supply because of some market factors in other parts of the country. That product's now off patent, and we have about five or six different herbicides with that active ingredient registered in California crops. I've got a few of them listed there. The registrations typically are the same as the Rely branded products. Um, and same with surfactants and adjuvants. This is a primarily a post-emergent herbicide. Its, its real strength is that it has both broadleaf and grass activity. Um, it, it's uh, mostly a, a contact material with a very minor amount of translocation. One thing I'll say about this herbicide, I, sh I showed you some photos with glufosinate injury on young almond trees. This is something to be aware of. When this herbicide was in relatively short supply, of course, we, we used less of it in orchard crops and we saw much less injury. As the other uh, manufacturers are bringing this, the, the, this AI back into the market, we need to be certainly be cognizant that we can we can injure uh, young trees uh, through bark uptake. A couple of others that I'll hit on: a sulfentrazone or Zeus. This was registered in some tree crops uh, in 2014, so we're a couple years into this. This is an, uh, a PPO inhibitor. It's in the same class of chemistry as Chateau. It's primarily a pre-emergent herbicide, but it has some post activity. This has some registrations on pistachio and walnut in the tree nut system, also citrus, but is not currently registered on almonds and stone fruits, so, so certainly be aware of that. Um, this product is primarily a broadleaf herbicide, but interestingly, it has some activity on nut sedges, so its, it's fit might actually be primarily for nut sedge uh, problems in, in these younger orchards. Um, because it's not a, as broad spectrum as some of our other pre-herbicides, this is primarily going to be used as part of a tank mix or part of an integrated program. Uh, some of, I've had some questions about plazosulfuron or mission. This is not currently registered in any of the tree nut crops, but it is used quite extensively in grape and has some citrus re uh, registrations. It's a uh, group two herbicide, so it's in the same class as matrix, so that's where we tend to, to use it in those crops. But again, not registered on uh, any of the tree nuts at this point. <clears throat> 
a brand new registration at the end of 2015, so just a few months ago, um, at the time we're recording this, a Broadworks herbicide. This is an active ingredient called mesotrione. Interestingly, it's a brand new mode of action for orchard cropping systems. It's a bleaching herbicide. It uh, uh, affects an en enzyme called HPPD, but this is completely new for our cropping systems. Um, it has both pre and post activity, although its strength is primarily as a pre, in my opinion. Um, this can be used on tree nuts that are established at least 12 months after planting, so we can use it after about one year. It has a relatively short PHI um, in tree nuts and stone fruit. And this is this uh, kind of like Zeus. It's mostly, it's almost totally a broadleaf material, so it's going to be part of the tank mix, but it has where I think it fits is it controls some of our really important glyphosate-resistant broadleaf weeds like hairy fleabane and uh, horseweed. A few label changes. Um, I already spoke about Rely 280. We have, um, in the last couple of years, we've added some new cropping, new trees to that, uh, that herbicide label, including olive and pear, um, and, and most of the generic manufacturers have that same label. A venue, not, I think we had a reduction in the PHI that can be used almost any time in almost all of the tree crops. Uh, Fuselade, which is one of our grass herbicides, now has a bearing label. That's a citrus change. And then Chateau, we're now seeing, uh, has a supplemental label for olive and pomegranate. So not, not, quite, the market, uh, not quite the audience for this presentation, but certainly uh, impacts some of our orchard systems. Uh, a real important one uh, changed last year. Allion has been a, a really, really good pre-emergent herbicide. We had a major label change in tree, affecting tree nuts, grape, and stone fruit, and some of the other crops. Um, primarily, this um, because of crop safety concerns in some other states, that uh, this herbicide cannot currently be used in flood irrigated orchards. So that's something to be aware of if you use that irrigation system. Uh, there was no changes in terms of the age for almond, walnut, pistachio. That's still a one year uh, post planting, but there was a, a little bit of a change in the stone fruit. That's now a three year uh, stone fruit and olive, excuse me, a three year old uh, orchard. Really importantly, the maximum use rate now has a soil organic matter component to it. If we've got less than 1% organic matter, our max rate is 3.5 ounces. If we're above, if we're between 1 and 3%, we can still use 5 ounces. Um, they've also recommended using this product more during the winter period rather than in the spring um, for performance and crop safety uh, reasons. Um, <clears throat> a few other changes. This is a couple years old now, but there's been some VOC regulations that have affected a number of important pesticides in tree systems. The only herbicide currently affected by this is oxiflorin products. This is the goal type products, the, goal, the EC formulations of goal and galagan uh, and several other products. These are the ones that have that real solvent-based formulation and they contribute to ground level ozone. So there will be some um, restrictions based on use rate and timing of use in those crops uh, depending on the formulation. This does not affect the SC formulations like Gold Tender. Those don't have the same amount of uh, solvent, so they don't have the same uh, impact on the, the ground level ozone environment. So just to, to wrap up, I've got a few points here. Uh, weed management in new orchards, I think it's really critical to think about weed management and plan over several years. Preferably you think about it before you come into that new crop, so you can, you know, after you rotate out whatever the previous crop was, the previous orchard or the previous annual crop, you use some very broad spectrum control strategies to minimize the weed problems before you come in with, with that young planting. There's going to be extra challenges. That's just the way it is in an orchard crop because you've got a much less competitive uh, crop. You've got a lot of sunlight hitting the ground and you probably have fewer weed control choices. So you're going to have to, there's going to take more management. That's going to take some cost and probably more importantly the time of the weed managers. A couple of take home messages I would add to this. For any of our herbicide programs, um, particularly the pre-emergent based program, good burn down is, is essential. Most of our pre-herbicides have little or no post-emergent activity. So if you go out and have an existing weed spectrum and you apply only a pre, you're not going to get good activity. The, the weeds that are there are going to do okay. Um, think about the formulations and AI load. This is specifically, almost uh, totally thinking about glyphosate. There's probably about 50 glyphosate herbicides registered in California, and they range from three pounds of glyphosate per gallon to the four and a half pound per gallon material. So, yeah, and, and also the surfactant packages can vary widely. So if you're comparing a generic three pound glyphosate with a very low surfactant load to a four and a half pound glyphosate with a high surfactant load, 
those are very different. You know, one, one pint or one quart of, of one is not the same as one pint or one quart of the other. So think about what you're actually applying in terms of uh, active ingredient. And really, in orchards with really heavy weed populations, it's probably going to take several years to clean those up. Um, particularly if, if you let them get away, it's hard to burn down uh, large weeds, and then it's hard to get rid of the old veg vegetative matter, the carcasses and, and standing weeds that can also hold leaves and other material, which can make it even more challenging to get pre-herbicides on, on and in the soil. Herbicide soil contact is really crucial for the pre-emergent herbicides. So blowing off those leaves or sweeping the berms before that, that pre-emergent herbicide goes on can really increase uh, the efficacy of the herbicide. So we, we need to use those herbicides well. We have a number of really good pre-emergent herbicides, and quite a few of those are actually registered in younger plantings of trees. So we just need to make sure we're picking the right herbicide, applying them well, and, and using them to the best uh, benefit for our orchards. One thing we're seeing in recent years as well, um, we tend to see most of our weed problems in the wintertime when we've got rainfall to germinate our weeds. But we've had some issues with summer weeds, particularly summer uh, glyphosate-resistant grasses. And one of the uh, opportunities, perhaps, is to use a sequential pre-emergent herbicide program to control both the winter weeds and the summer weeds that may be germinating through June and July and August in the orchard system. And with that, I will end my presentation, and I will see you, I'm sure, at a future Cooperative Extension meeting. Thank you.